Hello, my friends. Merry Christmas. I'm excited that December is here and the Christmas season is on us. It's one of my favorite times of the year where we get to think about Jesus and his birth and what that really means for all of us. This month, we're going to dive into a sermon series called Learning to Lean on Jesus, where we look at different people in the story of Jesus's birth and how they had to trust God during some really difficult and hard times in their lives and try to find you know, things that can help us as we walk through the difficult and hard times in our lives as we are waiting for Jesus to come back the second time. I hope you enjoy this journey as much as I'm going to, and I hope you'll join me for the whole thing. Before we get started today, will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for who you are, and that you sent Jesus down to earth as a baby so that he could grow up and die for us. Lord, I thank you so much for that amazing blessing. And Lord, as we're in the Christmas season, give us your eyes to see the people around us. And Lord, teach us how to lean on you and what that looks like. As we're diving into the different stories, I just pray that it is your words that are heard and not mine. And Lord, teach us how we can trust you and what that looks like in our everyday, crazy, busy, hectic lives. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In your name we pray, amen. Around Christmas, many of us get to spend time with relatives, and spending time with relatives can be good, bad, or other. But as we're diving into Jesus' story, we need to understand a little bit about his relatives, especially his um, mom's cousin and her husband, to just give us some background, a little bit of history about Jesus and how that plays a role in his life later. So we're gonna be looking at the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth as found in Luke chapter one. And we're gonna be starting in verse five. So turn with me to Luke chapter one, verse five. And it says, when Herod was king of Judah, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah and his wife Elizabeth was also a priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were very old. And so this verse sets up a whole bunch of interesting things that we need to understand about what's going on with Zachariah and Elizabeth. First of all, Zachariah was a priest. Um, priests normally would retire or the retirement age was 50, but they didn't have to retire. Most priests didn't actually stop serving until they were too old or sick to be able to serve because they loved that job. So they were able to retire as soon as 50, but most of them didn't. And this verse tells us that both Zechariah and Elizabeth are very old. But what is really interesting is that they were both considered righteous in God's eyes. The word righteous means like God, you know, in God's presence. But back then it had a very special connotation. In the Jewish mindset, if you were considered righteous, it meant that you kept all of the Jewish laws, that you did everything you were supposed to do as a Jewish person. Now to do this would have been a lot of work. And so very few people were considered righteous. So for the fact that Zachariah and Elizabeth were considered righteous, it was huge. It was huge that um, they lived a life that truly exemplified God. They did their best to their ability to do everything to be obedient to God. Not only did they live a righteous life, but then Luke tells us again that they obeyed all the Lord's commands and regulations. So they are living a righteous life, trying to obey all the Jewish laws, and they're to the best of their ability, everything God has told them to do, they are willing to do. Yet in spite of it all, there is a big problem. And the big problem is they don't have any children. And this was huge because even though they are righteous and they're loving God and they are leaning into him and doing everything they can to serve him, God has not blessed them with kids. And this is actually seen in the Jewish mindset as a curse from God. For you not to have kids um, meant that God was looking down on you. If God gave you many kids, God had blessed you, he'd filled your home with love and laughter and prosperity. But if you didn't have kids, um, people assumed that somehow you had done something wrong. So Luke is telling us that Zachary and Elizabeth are quite the opposite. They are righteous. They are doing everything they can to love and obey God, but they still don't have kids. Now this problem hits home for a lot of people. The desire to have kids is great and many people struggle with that. Infertility is a huge issue in our nation and in our world. But back then it had the added stigma of God had cursed you or it was a punishment from God. 
And so I can imagine for years and years and years, they had prayed as a couple. Many other people throughout the Bible has seen this as a recourse for, you know, having multiple wives or, you know, having a concubine to have babies. Abraham does it. Jacob does it. Lots of um, people who were considered upstanding, righteous men, Jewish men, decided to take matters into their own hands. Another proof that Zachariah and Elizabeth have decided to lean into God and all that they do and are righteous is that they don't have kids in their old age and they haven't tried to fix their problem. Which would have mean that there would have been comments and whispers and people would have made assumptions about them and it would have been very hard. Not only the personal disappointments, but the stigma associated with that. And I can imagine as they prayed, they would feel like their prayers are falling on deaf ears and God, maybe they asked questions like Job did. You know, God, why? Tell, tell me why. What did we do wrong? You know, if we did something wrong, tell us. And it just feels like the prayers are going nowhere. Have you ever had a problem or struggle with something that's really hard and you just feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and they're not getting to God? Well, I want you to learn to lean on Jesus like Zachariah and Elizabeth did. Because even though it feels like their prayers are not being answered, they don't give up hope. And we know that they don't give up hope because in their old age, when Zachariah is called up to service, they are still counted as righteous. So as we continue reading in verse 8, it says, One day Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. So there's some interesting things here that we need to understand. The whole idea of um, being chosen by lot was awesome. The Hebrews understood that God would be the one that would lead and orchestrate the choosing of lots. So what would happen is all of the priests who are on duty, and it tells us Zechariah was from the priestly line of Abijah. So there was 24 units and they would each serve twice a year. So they would all come together. So many priests would show up for each unit that there wasn't enough jobs to go around in the sanctuary. And so they would cast lots. And the way that they would do this is all the priests would show up in the morning and they would stand in a semicircle and they would hold up their hands. And on their hands, they would hold up one or two fingers. And it didn't matter, they could decide one or two fingers. And then um, the priest in charge, uh, the high priest would go around and he would decide, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, the number I choose today is 72. And so he'd start counting and he'd count one, two, and then go to the next priest, three, go to the next priest, four, five, and he'd go around the circle and he'd count to 72. When he got to 72, the priest, it landed on, that priest would get to serve in the first roll. He would count another 72 and that priest would get to serve in the second roll and then he'd count another 72 and that priest would get to serve in the third roll. Well, the third roll that was open to the priest was officiating at the altar of incense. And this was seen as the prize role because while others are out, you know, slaughtering the lamb and while they're, you know, doing other jobs in the sanctuary, this priest would get to choose two other priests and he would take them with him into the holy place. The first priest would clean out the coals from the altar of incense and the second priest would put in new coals to the altar of incense and then they would leave. And then the priest who had been chosen, which is this time Zachariah, would get to stand there before the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place in front of the altar of incense. And he would get to put the incense on the altar. And as the incense would begin to burn, smoke would begin to fill the holy place and move to the most holy place and just permeate the whole temple. And the crowds outside could smell it. And the smoke represented the prayers of the people ascending to God. It was a call to prayer. And so the priest who was standing there who got this privilege, he was tasked with praying and his prayer would consist of two major parts. First of all, a prayer of uh, forgiveness for the people and their sins, that God would remember his love and covenant and would forgive people of their sins. And second, that God would remember his promise and send the Messiah, the Redeemer. And this is what the prayer would be all about. And so this is a huge honor and there's so many priests at this time that some people never even got chosen for this honor. And sometimes it was a once in a lifetime thing. 
Well, Zechariah is old and he has honored God and God has chosen him for this amazing honor. He's standing in there offering the burnt offering and here's what happens in verse 11. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. So here's Zechariah. He's going through this awesome ritual. I assume he is so honored and just, just enjoying every minute of it. And all of a sudden, there's someone in the sanctuary that's not supposed to be there. He was supposed to be alone. And when he looks up, it's an angel standing to the right of the altar. And this position to the right of the altar was a position of favor. It was a good position. If you were to somebody's right, it meant they favored you. It was awesome. And so the position of the angel should have said to Zechariah, you don't need to be afraid. This is good news. This angel has great news for you. But instead, Zechariah is shaken and afraid. You see, Zechariah is there praying, and Zechariah has been praying his whole life. He's been living a holy life for God. But still, when an angel shows up and says, you know, God has answered your prayers, instead of excitement, instead of joy, there is fear. And this is very common when angels show up because people are a little scared. They're not used to God visibly answering their prayers, like right there, or sending, you know, a promise of the answer to prayer. But also when an angel doesn't show up, but God answers our prayer, sometimes we can be afraid because we can pray for something so long, but we can be so comfortable in our unhealthy ways that it's scary to think about actually having God answer this prayer, or we're not actually quite sure if God can answer the prayer. And so we, there's a lot of fear that goes with it. And so the angel, the first thing he says to Zechariah is don't be afraid. You see, God wants us to know that as he's answering our prayers, and it doesn't matter the stigma we're living under or how difficult the circumstances or um, how long we've prayed for something, or maybe Zechariah and Elizabeth had stopped praying for a baby. Maybe they had to stop praying, but God is there and he hears and he doesn't want us to be afraid no matter what our circumstances are. And so the angel says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Now, what prayer has God heard? Well, some people think the prayer that God heard was he was standing there in front of the incense altar and he would have been praying that God would forgive the nation and that he would send the Redeemer. Well, yes, the Redeemer is about to come and God's about to tell Zechariah that his son is going to be Elijah that's going to prepare the way for Jesus. So that's one prayer. But what he says next also lends us in to something else. He says, God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you are to name him John. So <laughs> Zechariah probably long since had stopped praying for a son. His wife is so old, there's no physical way that she can give birth. And that would not have been his role. So even if he still prayed for that, just by hopes God could possibly answer it, he wouldn't have been praying for a son now. And so what this tells me is that God answers the prayers we pray, even when our faith is so weak or we're not actively praying it anymore. God can still, you know, be activated because we've prayed. Sometimes we think God has forgotten and God hasn't forgotten. He's not waiting for us to get to the right number of prayers. He's not waiting for us to get to, you know, just say the right way or for us to figure out something. There's lots of reasons God waits. He waits for the fullness of time. He waits for just the right time. And you see, Jesus came at just the right time. And so in order to answer Zachariah and Elizabeth's prayer, God needed a righteous family to be the parents of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, because John the Baptist was the prophesied Elijah who was gonna prepare the way for Jesus to come. But it wasn't the right time when Zachariah and Elizabeth were young. And so even though they might have been praying way back then, it wasn't that God didn't hear their prayer. And it wasn't that God hadn't said yes. His um, answer was, you just have to trust me and you just have to wait. And as we're learning to lean on Jesus, that type of answer to prayer is the one that is the hardest to swallow sometimes. Like say no, just say no and I can wrap my head around that. And I can just get over it. And I think that's what um, Zachariah and Elizabeth thought, that God had just said no. And so they just accepted their lot in light. But you see, God hadn't said no. He'd said wait. And he had said, trust me, it's not the right time. 
and he hadn't told them as much. And sometimes I wish God would say, okay, Jen, I'll give you exactly what you're praying for. You just need to wait 10 years. And then I'd be like, okay, I can wait 10 years. But you see, God doesn't do that. And is the reason he doesn't do that is because it's a faith journey that I go on and it's a faith journey that you go on as we learn to lean on Jesus every day of our lives through the ups and the downs, but through the disappointments when God is saying wait or when he's saying no and when it's hard and when it's difficult and it feels like we just can't get out. So the angel says, God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or drink alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. This angel is not only saying God has heard your prayers, but he is saying, he's telling Zechariah, who is a priest, who would have known the prophecies of the Messiah, that your son is going to be Elijah, who's coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. Your son is going to be part of something so much bigger than you. And if I was Zechariah and an angel just told me that my prayers are answered, I'd be like, yay, God, thank you so much. That's so awesome. But that's not how Zechariah responds. Instead, in verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now and my wife is also well along in years. And it's easy to look at this and go, Zechariah, how could you doubt? You're a priest. You serve God. You're in the temple. You're talking to an angel. The angel's telling you about a prophecy. An angel's telling you that God has answered your prayers. How can you doubt? Well, how do we doubt? When God has promised to be with us and to never leave us or forsake us, how can we doubt? When God um, blesses us after blessing after blessing, and then when one hard time comes, we just aren't sure that God can help us anymore. How can we doubt when we get this sense that God's going to answer our prayers, but we're like, yeah, but how God? I just don't, I just don't know how you could do that. Maybe Zechariah had gotten so used to believing that God's answer was no, that he, he couldn't logistically understand how the answer could be yes. Because in his human mind, there's no way to make this work. And so he asked the angel, how can I know? How can I be sure? And it's almost as if he's saying, I don't want to get my hopes up. Like, I don't, I, um, like, I, I kind of want to believe you, but I also don't. Because, like, going back to that place of hope is so hard. Because if it doesn't happen, it's going to hurt more than if I just stay here in this place of unbelief. And the angel looks at him and says, I am the angel Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But since you don't believe what I said to you, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. So Gabriel's like, <laughs> I'm Gabriel. What do you mean? How can I know this is going to happen? God doesn't send Gabriel just to tell you something and say, eh, just joking. <laughs> or, oh, that's not going to really happen. Just wanted to see how you'd respond. Like, no, I'm Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. I'm in his presence. But since you asked for a sign, I'll give you one because of your disbelief. Because you don't believe what God said, you are going to not be able to speak. But the word for not being able to speak can be translated as um, both, you know, dumb, not being able to speak, but also deaf. And later on, when they're trying to communicate with um, Zachariah, he has to write. They can't even ask him questions. And so basically what the angel does is Zachariah, that moment, immediately becomes deaf and dumb. He can't hear and he can't speak. And immediately... Zechariah knows God's going to do this thing. It's going to happen. But even though Zechariah knows right away because the angel gave him his sign, it still doesn't change anything. And so the angel disappears and Zechariah, what had been the hustle and the bustle and the noise of the crowd out there and the trumpets playing and um, everything, all of a sudden it's silence. It's just him and his thoughts and his 
conversations in his head with God. There's nothing else but dead silence. And I think this is both a punishment and a gift because God is saying, you've got to drown out the doubts. You have to drown out the voices. You have to drown out what everyone else is saying and just listen to me. You have to trust me and just listen to me, push them all aside. And as we're learning to lean on Jesus, getting rid of the voices, the physical voices of the naysayers in our lives. And it doesn't matter who they are, it can be just crowd people. It can be um, a random person on the street. It can be your boss. It can be family members. It can be the voices in your head, your own expectations. And what God is saying is you've got to, like it's got, you, they've got to be silenced. You've got to learn to silence those all and hear my voice. Spend time with me. And so this proof that Zachariah asks for because he doubts, God doesn't, and say, well, nope, now you don't get what I said you were going to get because you doubted me. No, God gives him the proof he asked for because he knew he needed it. And this proof then serves as a way to mark this event so that others will remember it too. And so here's what happens next. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. Verse 22, when he finally did come out, he couldn't speak. When they realized this from his gestures and his silence, and that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zachariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterwards, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she explained. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. So here's what happens. Everything goes quiet. And it's just Zachariah and God. And Zechariah goes out to the crowds and what he's supposed to do is he's supposed to stand there and bless the people. But because doubt that had been the last thing out of his mouth, he was unable to speak. And so God didn't allow him to pronounce a blessing over the people through his words. But maybe like Moses and maybe like Elijah and maybe like everybody else who'd been in God's presence, he was shining. And the blessing came from what was shining from his face. They see him and he's gesturing and they realize he's seen a vision. There's something about his countenance. And so they know that something special has happened today. And he... He doesn't know, he can't communicate with them. He can't tell them what it is, but they know something has happened. So Zechariah goes home and he is able to communicate with his wife and she gets pregnant. And what she does is she stays in seclusion. We're not sure why she stays in seclusion. There's no necessary reason for doing it. Maybe that was, um, she didn't want people to talk or to question. Maybe we're just not quite sure. But she's in seclusion for five months. But here's how Elizabeth responds. She says, how kind is the Lord? She exclaimed, he has taken away my disgrace of having no children. So she has this belief and she is praising God, thanking him for all he's done. Next week, we're going to look at Mary because Mary comes to spend some time with Zachary and Elizabeth. But we're going to jump to after Mary um, gets there to the birth of John. So we're going to jump to Luke chapter 1, verse um, 57. It says, When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. When it was time, the original language, it says when the time was full, at God's perfect timing. You see, God has a perfect timing for things in their life as well as our lives. And we have to trust God's perfect timing. We have to trust when God says, wait. We have to trust when God says, no. We have to trust when God says, listen, I know everything. So when the time was full, when all the pieces were ready, when all the pieces were in place, that's when baby was born. Elizabeth baby was born and she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been merciful to her, they rejoiced with her. There's this idea that they were just happy with her. They were like full on partying and celebrating. God has been so good and he has blessed you so, so much. Verse 59 says, when the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony they wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What, they exclaimed, there is no one in your family by that name. So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John. 
what's happening here is because um, Zachariah is both, um, he can't speak and he can't hear, he can't communicate. And so the neighbors and the family, probably some of them priests themselves, take it upon themselves to lead out in this ceremony, to get it all going. And, you know, the Hebrew tradition is name him after someone in the family. So let's honor Zachariah. We'll name him after his dad. He can be Zachariah Jr. That would be fantastic. And Zachariah has been able to communicate with Elizabeth and she knows that the baby's name is not supposed to be Zachariah, it's supposed to be John. And so she says, no. And she speaks up. She says, no, his name is John. But they don't believe her. They don't, why would you do that? There's no one in your family named John. And so they go to Zachariah and he pulls out a writing tablet, which would not have been a normal thing in a Jewish home. But because that would have been his only way to communicate, which also lets us know the intelligence of Elizabeth and Zechariah that they were both able to read and write so they could communicate with each other. He pulls out the tablet and said, his name is John. In the nine months of silence with him and God, all of his doubt have been washed away. All of doing it my way, all of staying in the comfort zone, all in doing what other people think is right and listening to those outside voices, it, it has all been washed away. There's no normal, there's no right way to do it. The right way to do it is doing what God has told me to do and the angel told me to name the baby John and I'm going to name the baby John. And so he writes, his name is John. And what happens immediately when he writes his name is John? Immediately in verse 64, Zechariah could speak again and he began to praise God. Awe fell on the whole neighborhood as the news of what happened spread through the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, what will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely on him in a special way. You see, the hand of the Lord was truly on John, but the hand of the Lord was also on Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Zechariah had this whole learning experience where he had to learn to lean on Jesus. And part of that process required him to be quiet. And sometimes we have to stop fixing it ourselves and stop figuring it out. We have to stop with our doubt and we have to stop with the voices and we have to learn to sit at Jesus' feet in the silence. We are told to be still and know that I am God. And as we are learning to lean on Jesus, how many of us actually do that? Do you take time? Maybe you read your Bible and you check off the list. Maybe you sing a song and you go and then you just keep moving. But how many of us, after we spend time in God's word or singing a praise song or journaling, how many of us just take time to be quiet in God's presence and let him speak and ask him to push out the distractions? It's in the quiet and it's in the knowing that God is God and we can trust him, that our faith grows to the point that it doesn't matter what the voices say. It doesn't matter what the crowd is saying around us. We are going to be obedient to God. My friends, as we have processed this passage in Luke chapter one, what has God said to you? I truly would like to know what God has said to you. And so I ask you to grab your connection cards by texting the letter CC to 301-321-8848. And let me know what did God say to you? What really stood out to you in John chapter one as we process Zechariah and his story? And second, how are you gonna to respond to God? Are you gonna be like Zachariah, respond with doubt and insecurity? Are you gonna respond like Elizabeth with, my God has been gracious, he has blessed me. Like, how are you gonna to respond to God? What does that look like for you? And lastly, how can we pray for you? Because we need each other on this journey and we mess it up, I mess it up. I am often Zachariah. And I'm just thankful for a God who is willing to meet me where I'm at and still work with me in spite of the fact. Let me pray for you now. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you that as we're learning to lean on you, that we can trust you even with the unanswered prayers or the hard times in life or the places that feel so tricky that it feels like you're not answering them. There's no way you could fix it. And so Lord, I pray that you give us a faith to trust you and to know that your time is perfect, that your ways are perfect, and that we can trust you. Help us to push out the distractions and the noise around us so that the only voice that we hear is your voice and the only person we see is you. Lord, teach us to listen. Teach us to sit at your feet and to listen. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. 
want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today at Greater Than I. We truly believe in discipleship, and part of discipleship is learning to process God's word for ourselves. And so I would like to invite you to come and join us as we discuss this passage together today at 1130. We're going to do that live in person at our building at 14595 Avion Parkway in Chantilly, Virginia. Or you can join us on Zoom, and you can get the Zoom links by texting the word STUDY to 301-321-8848. I really hope you'll join us and you'll let us um, lean into and invest in you. I hope you have a great day and I look forward to studying with you soon.